Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk, uh, A Glimpse into the Future of Grid. Uh, we are working on some major features that uh, will change how you develop your UI and interact with other JavaScript uh, libraries in your grid applications. In this talk, I will try to give you an idea why we are doing this change and how it's going to look like at the end. First, about myself, uh, my name is Göktu Göktuğan. I work as a software engineer in uh, Google Grid team. Uh, before joining uh, in, in Grid team, I mostly focus on the library side of the SDK. Uh, before that, I used to work on uh, Grid libraries that are internal to the Google. So let's go back to the interesting stuff. So uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, Everything I discuss in the presentation are not finalized. They are, uh, there are, there's a lot of moving parts in these pieces and it may change a lot. But uh, nevertheless, I'm pretty confident that it will change how, uh, how it, it will improve our ecosystem in the long run. So first of all, why we are doing this? We just, uh, in order to understand uh, the why, we need to understand the history of the widgets. Uh, I will start with a quote from one of the internal uh, grid docu documents, and it basically says that uh, the, there is no current way to define widget hierarchies, and there is no way to create custom DOM element classes. That's basically one of the major uh, missing pieces in the web, so that Grid comes with its own concept for widgets. This alone explains a lot on why we needed them. And actually, there's more memory leaks. In the past, almost all browsers had significant problems with memory leaks. And uh, perhaps some considered this as a feature. It took them so long to fix. And uh, actually, Grid worked around these problems with DOM events, with very complex event system. And if you look at the design of the widget system, you will see its impact in every part of the widgets. And uh, for example, like the event bits and the sync events, those are all needed for mostly for this purpose. So uh, if you think about it, there was no widget concept before and uh, a standard concept before, and the web was dominated by the leaky browsers like IE6. Today, uh, today is a all different world. Uh, we are right now, uh, the web technologies are moving in a much faster pace. IE6 is no longer a concern, uh, and also market is dominated by evergreen browsers, which are automatically updated and standard based and very powerful. And last and but not the least, we have now the web components, which are the, very web, the web's very own spec for standard widget system. So let's make a quick dive into web components. And uh, first, a quick question. How many of you have heard about web components before? OK, I see a reasonable amount of hands. And I can guarantee other people who didn't raise hands, they will hear that a lot in the future. Uh, so web components is actually uh, an umbrella term that covers uh, multiple upcoming HTML5 specs. And, uh, it, these specs are basically uh, provides a cleaner integration and reuse of UI code for the web. One of the most essential pieces of this spec is, is the of these specs is the ability to define custom elements. Uh, as the name suggests, custom elements enable you to define your own text for HTML and teach the browser new tricks like older ones like this blink tag and even. Support for Blink tag is gone now, and it's dead. We can actually redefine this tag and use some basic CSS to simulate the existing Blink tag, and it can live forever. Also, we can do more fun things with this uh, web components. For example, this Gangnam Style tag. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so, uh, this, is, this is a funny one. Uh, it doesn't do much other than uh, this dancing robot. And 
by including just a few lines of code, you can include this functionality in your web application and you can have, dance, have dancing robots. And the idea is actually, even it's funny, the idea is, is as simple as it takes to include some custom text and importing some web component to your web application to include this functionality. The custom elements is not only uh, good for defining new elements, uh, it's also good for extending the existing ones. Like uh, in this example, we are, exist uh, we are extending the button and we are basically adding, uh, sorry. Yeah. There are testing, just one second. Okay, I think I can survive this, or no. Sorry. So we, we can also define, uh, ex instead of just defining new elements, we can also uh, extend the, ex the behavior of the existing elements. And in here we can uh, define this button to behave differently, like doing this. And it can't make a sound. But the idea is you just not only limited to defining new elements, we can also add behavior to the existing elements. So, uh, so custom elements basically standardizes how we define our widgets and use elsewhere, elsewhere in the application. This may sound simple, but actually it's, that was something always missing in the web. And in every, bro in every library end up defining their own widget system that uh, their own concept that doesn't really interoperate, interoperate well with each other. Uh, the spec also defines some uh, other important stuff like the shadow DOM, which encapsulates the internals of your web components. Also, uh, there are templates that are kind of the blueprint for your components that uh, you can use to define, to define your component. But I will not go into any details of, uh, of these other features, but, we, but I uh, strongly suggest you to go over uh, Eric Biedelman's talk uh, he, he was actually the Googler whom I borrowed these examples from. You can easily find his presentations. Uh, so one important takeaway from all this web component stuff is uh, it is basically widgets for everyone. It's, no matter you develop your application with jQuery, uh, Dart, or Polymer, you can re reuse the parts of them elsewhere with uh, with uh, much uh, streamlined way. And this was, we have never been close to this kind of views before. So great progress in web and uh, which takes us to second part of my talk, the GUID and JavaScript interoperability. As I emphasized earlier, the web is moving in a much uh, faster pace and it's open for innovation. So. We need to accept the fact that we can no longer keep up with the momentum anymore with our existing tools. And uh, the web components is just one example, right? You want all other HTML5 beauties, you will, you, you, you will want all these HTML5 beauties in your application. And uh, also, right now we have a lot more complex scenarios with hybrid applications where we mix and match GUID and JavaScript together inside single application. We have a lot more, uh, we, uh, for this purpose, for example, Ray did a great job with Grid Exporter and uh, that runs at the library level, but actually with a smarter compiler, we can do much better. 
And uh, also, the other thing is there are different programmable models in JavaScript that are getting more popular every day. AngularJS, jQuery is just uh, some examples uh, of the many uh, JavaScript features, JavaScript libraries that change how you uh, develop your web applications. To me, it, is, it isn't really a sustainable model to have a good specific ecosystem that just maintained by good developers who are replicating what other developers have been doing in the JavaScript world. If we can't uh, do that, and if we can't keep up, then I think we need to change how we inter oper incorporate those features into our applications in a much more streamlined way. So if you look at how we interoperate with JavaScript and Grid today, we have two main uh, tools. First, the native functions with our, which are called Disney, and we have JavaScript objects and called JSO. Uh, let's talk about how these mechanisms work today and see what we can do and can't do with them. Disney is, is the key feature for JavaScript interoperable interop in Grid. If you think about it, it's like the assembly language for JS is like the assembly language for Grid. And uh, in order to run assembly code in a regular Java, Java code, you need to define a native function and write some GNI code and bundle it together. You do exactly the same uh, in Grid. You write native methods, and this time, instead of defining them elsewhere, you just make the declaration as part of your method, and tada. It works. Uh, it's quite smart, but uh, also if you think about it, it's the perfect analogy. You can uh, easily understand the idea, but reality is a little bit different. First, a GNI code is much, uh, is quite verbose, and th th that's also true for GNI code. We end up, if the second problem is we end up writing a lot of GNI code. If you, if you look at this example, it's taken from SDK. We kind of clean this up, but it's still there's a lot of uh, part of this code is remaining. You can see this kind of code a lot in the SDK. And uh, the third and the worst part is not only we are writing this code, you are also end up writing this Disney code. Let's look at the second tool, the JSOs. Uh, second tool, uh, JSOs is providing uh, an abstraction for JavaScript objects in the GUID site. And currently, every JavaScript object inside the uh, uh, SDK is, is represented with classes that are extending from this abstraction. The way JSOs works is they are basically placeholders in the code to instruct the compiler that this is not a Java object. And in response, the, the GUID compiler treats every call to these classes as static methods which means that in order for a compiler to correctly achieve that part, it needs to guarantee that there is no uh, polymorphism or anything that will make it work inconsistent. So for, to prove that it provides strong limitations on what we can do with them. First, they can't be constructed with NIF because the compiler doesn't really know how to construct them, so that's always returned from native functions. Also, methods, the, these methods, pub, if they are public, they always need to be final so that they cannot be overridden and cause some polymorphic dispatch. And because of the very same reason, you cannot uh, implement a Java interface more than once JSO. Given the, these tools, you are quite limited to what you can do with them. And uh, you can't mix and match the type hierarchies from and JavaScript together. You can't even extend the JavaScript object, and your code is actually harder to test with regular JUnit tests because native functions are much harder to mock. And the worst part is even if you don't directly depend on them, you still need to deal with them for testing purposes. All this together gives you very... Uh, also, one other thing about this native, uh, the testability part is the, the reason with but one of the strongest reasons Grid was an advocate of MVP and pushing it forward was to deal with these native functions. So all of this together gives you very limited tools to play with and 
you are missing many design opportunities that give, give you more extension with, uh, as, with much less boilerplate. So this is more or less where we stand today, and we actually have a much better answer for tomorrow. The first construct we are introducing is the JS interface. In most basic definition, a JS interface is a, is a, a Java-friendly abstraction for your JavaScript API, and it directly maps your JavaScript API. In this example, uh, it literally means that this object they are, that we are abstracting with window interface has the alert method, uh, has a method named alert, and it takes a string as a parameter. Let's also add an uh, event listener and compare it with the older approach. When we pass callbacks to JavaScript like this event listener, we need to write additional boilerplate. And also you need to understand more about this uh, GNI syntax and you need to always you end up forgetting and taking, go and look at the spec to see how you represent stuff. And this really doesn't necessarily fit. Right now with the JS interface, we still don't need to write any codes. Uh, I just declare the event listener at event listener function, and the compiler is smart about understanding this, understanding that this is the callback interface, and function correctly and handle it as expected. In addition to provide access to functions, uh, we also provide access to properties of these objects. You can uh, just hit JS property, and for example, in this case, window has a property name called uh, co name property name called name, uh, and we can just provide the accessors and annotate them with, with JS property. With also JS with JS interfaces for the very first time, GUID becomes aware of the prototype of the JavaScript objects. What it means is GUID can, for example, properly generate the typecasting checks for your JavaScript object because it knows, it knows more about your JavaScript object. It's not only good for safeness, it's useful also because now, for the very first time, your Java object can actually extend a JavaScript object using this prototype information. For this purposes, GUID compiler generates a special class called that prototype, and then you can use this class to extend your JavaScript type. Being able to extend JavaScript type is uh, very important for uh, supporting web components because every web component needs, needs to be extended from HTML element. One last neat feature of JS interface I will talk about today is the JS export functionality. Using JS export, you can make your grid code easily callable and usable from the JavaScript side. In this example, the constructor is uh, exported with uh, the JS export annotation so that object can be constructed from the JavaScript side and the methods of the object can be called directly given that these are part of a JS interface. So this is now what it takes to bring two code bases together. So there are other parts of the spec uh, we are still working on, and, and I will not go into details, but I will just give a brief introduction. Like the Java 8 Defender methods are used for polyfilling with the JS interfaces. We have uh, proposing a grid JSON function that replaces these native functions that even you end up writing some native code, you gonna need, you will not need to write a native function, you can just uh, write it as a code snippet in pass to a function. And uh, we have JS convert, which provides auto type conversions for our types and many others, but they are all working, uh, work in progress and I'm not going to cover. You can look at the spec for more information. So now we have the necessary tools and uh, we can talk about widget 2.0, the next gener generation of the widget system for grid. As we reach a, to a point where our all initial reasonings to have our own widget system is obsolete, we can still we can start thinking about how to move forward. 
as you might have already guessed, the idea is to basically follow the standards and replace the grid widgets with web components. Actually, this basic, the basic support is quite straightforward, given that we have the JS interop capabilities in place. I will switch the idea and I will show you hands-on how JS interface works and putting some web component support into our application. Hopefully. So I will. Okay. Is it readable right now? So I will start by, uh, so I will write this example without, write, without using much or any user library functionality so that you can see how it's uh, easy to quickly move forward. So I will start with writing, getting access to the doc document of my application. And this method will directly basically execute the doc and it will, it should return a document. And let's define this document. So this is going to be a JS interface because it's basically a contract with our Java code and JavaScript. So let's put the JS interface annotation here. And let's convert this one. And uh, first, I missed this part. So uh, before had I added two imports to my HTML, one for Polymer UI toggle button, which is a simple toggle button written by Polymer, and the second one is the Google Map uh, component. They are all web components. So I will start by creating uh, my element using its tag name, which is uh, And this is supposed to return an HTML element that's not defined yet. We are going to define that as a button. And let's start with creating this interface. And again, this is a JS interface because it's a contract with our JavaScript object API. And we will have a create element method defined in the document that returns this. If you notice, I'm just writing the code and let the Eclipse do the generation of these interfaces, and it just works. I mean, I can, uh, next step, I can add my event listener. For, let's listen, click event, and let's get First, create this method. I hit the typo here. I hope that I don't have anything else. Okay. So I edited an event listener, and let's see. Uh, we don't have this in person. I'm not going to generate this one. I will just import it as a simple definition. And in here, I will just show the window.alert. I'm just going to take the shortcut and. Yeah. Thanks. So, this is the compiler team. <laughs> so, uh, the second part is I created an edit event listener. Now I need to append it to my body. So I will just go ahead and access it through Disney. I will say doc.body, which again should return, 
HTML element, body. And in here we can append child uh, button. And again, I'm generating this by just help of Eclipse. Hopefully, this should work right. Okay, let me just zoom out. Okay, so I just click compile. It works, great. So we have now included a polymer uh, button inside our Gwit application with, uh, with a few lines of code. So I will not make you bored to that and I will copy paste more interesting stuff so that we can move forward in a quicker fashion. So it's, it's very similar to the previous state. I just incorporated the Google Map uh, web component. It extends from HTML element. It uh, defines the show center marker property with using JS property annotation, so it's the property of the Google map. And it just does the same thing. It creates the element, sets the style, appends the child. And one other thing is we are basically in here, in the event listener, we now are switching this center marker with the uh, event handling. So let's go ahead and compile it again. So let's refresh so that we get the Google Maps. That happens sometimes. So if we click the button, now we have two web components written with a different technology, now working inside Quid, collaborating with each other. So we can zoom in, zoom out, and everything works. So as the second part of this practice, we actually only use web components. I'm going to show you one example how we can uh, define our web component, and I will try to do it quickly. I will define my own map component. I will bring these two widgets together, put it inside my map component, so that I will have one widget that abstracts both together. And to do that, my, I basically going to extend my HTML element dot prototype, which I showed earlier. And I, I'm going to do one more thing here, which is web components define some element uh, lifecycle events, like created, entered to view, and left to view. So I will add the lifecycle event so uh, I can get notified when the element is created. That means I need to implement these methods. So here I can, in the created part, I can do my definition of the widget. So I will go and copy paste the existing code we have written here. And paste it here. Here I was adding to the body. I will get rid of the body. I will call super append, which means it's going to append to myself. And so we have the my map here. So we, we have defined the my map web component. Now in here we can uh, get rid of the definitions and actually can. First we need to register our web component. I will choose the tag name, my map. By the way, you need to have a dash in the name as part of the spec to make it uh, not collide with any upcoming web elements. So, and I will instantiate my map. And so this line is going to register my map component with the application. And in here, I will comment this out. And I will instantiate and append to the body. So I defined a new widget, I put the existing widget inside it, and now I, my application just creates the, the widget we just defined. And hopefully, I'm gonna do So hopefully it still works, that's good. So the second part is actually, instead of creating it with here, I can, I don't, 
need to do that, I can just go ahead and do create element and give the tag. By the way, is it usable? I'm sorry, it's, I didn't put it, it was small, but I'm writing code here. Okay. So, so I can, that means I can use the tag name, right? So let's see if it's gonna work. So it's still working. So one thing, if you look at right now, if you look in spec, I'm gonna, sh yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you look at Inspector DOM, now we have a my map tag, as you would expect, and Google map element and Polymer, it's laid out as you would expect. It's, it's not like a huge hierarchy of developments, and it's, it's not something like that. It's, it's a element structure that makes sense to you, and both, both to you and both browser. So this is the end of the demo. Uh, so let's switch back to okay. okay. Some, some weird stuff going on, but as long as you see. Is it readable? I will uh, put it back in the front, actually. Okay, I will change the resolution, as you suggested. Uh, if I can only find that screen. Not helping. I will try say something like this. Okay. I will. Okay. I will try to still continue, but I hope you can see something useful here. You are not missing much, so uh, I will continue. So as we already seen in the demo, uh, we defined uh, this is the imperative, imperative approach with programmatic style that you can define the button, register it, you can instantiate with its constructor or you can just use the create element to instantiate. Uh, okay, so in reality you shouldn't need much less code with the UI binding. If you look at here, uh, you can define a template, define your style sheet as part of your template. This is a regular HTML template with some improvements on it. And you can define your inner elements and with the IDs and it will use naming conventions to match your, uh, your elements inside the view. And you can call set text content and uh, change the content of the widget. So, uh, in here, this is a clock widget example. So, uh, in, this is a real clock with the uh, arrows, and this is basically be making some transformation by concatenating some style to find the latest style of the element. So, this handles all the details like the shadow DOM, custom element registration, and all other boilerplate in the declarative form. And Actually, for simpler widgets, we can do much better. We can just go ahead and define your template as part of your annotation if it's simple enough and style sheet, put it there, and there will be huge savings of amount of code for needed to be written for basic widgets that you will normally end up writing a lot of code. And you can concentrate on the part that really matters. If you go back to, to the clock example, uh, we can also do even more on, on this side by bringing the data binding. The data binding together with the templates, you can, they can make you go more declarative and even write uh, less code. So if you look at here, uh, we are using double messages to refer the fields inside our model so that in the model side, in the Java code, I just 
make the calculation to, to find the rotation of the second. I put it inside the field and it magically gets translated into a part of the style sheet. So in, that means that if you just look at the highlighted parts, you are writing the code that really matters and you want to test. And it's much more intuitive. And it's, I especially choose this example because it shows you uh, that you can write a testable code in a much more intuitive way and you can test what really matters. One other important note here, if you look at the syntax, I am, uh, this syntax is very similar to the ones used in Polymer and Angular, so we may or may not utilize them, them internally, it's early to say at the moment, but given that GUID is a, is a compiled language, we can actually do much more than what they can do. So for that reason, we might not use them and do much more optimizations. So the next steps. The first, we are going to revive revive the elemental based on the next gen JavaScript interoperability capabilities so that you can have full uh, type safe abstraction for HTML5 out of the box. Second, we are going to build the next generation templating system I was showing and that will reduce boilerplate and hide the unnecessary details of the uh, web component spec. Third, we are going to define a reasonable integration and migration path from the older widget system so that you can start using this sooner. In conclusion, we are working very hard to bring you the, uh, the best experience for developing web applications. And uh, in order to do that, we are uh, improving the compiler to be smarter, smarter about JavaScript. Also, we are building a more capable standard-based widget system. I hope you enjoy using them. Stay tuned and thanks for listening. So to start with, so the question is, uh, if I can rephrase correctly, uh, can we have the features of UI binder with the hierarchies and so on, uh, what's going to be like with the web components? Actually, with the templating we have here, it's not that different. Because the way it works, for example, web components provides you the isolation. So you can have the style sheet isolated to your element. You can hide the inners of your components, that's basically much more powerful, and you can still provide your hierarchies of your elements. So in that sense, if it just was going with this way, not touching UI binder, this will uh, complete, have the complete features of the UI binder. On the other hand, uh, we need to think about how we can bring back some of these features to the UI binder. The, the reason I didn't go that part is UI binder has a very complex code right now. I don't know if we want to go ahead and touch that code base. Uh, I cannot promise anything, but uh, if, first of all, we can definitely accept contributions if somebody comes up with uh, bringing some of these features back to UI binder, we can do that. Uh, we can just perhaps follow from the UI binder, but my anticipation is we're going to uh, have a different templating system that understands more about elements than other stuff. But it's not beyond our radar system. One of the options is that they can calculate how we integrate the old way system. They can make a match to do stuff with the old stuff. So yeah. we will encounter this. Uh, and I think right now we're concentrating on um, the new stuff first, mm -hmm. and then we'll figure out how to actually make a simple copy of the old stuff. Exactly. So the problem is, it's, I'm not sure if goes makes sense to delay this stuff and add data binding to UI binding, right? I'm, I'm not sure that's the best use of our time, but we will have a reasonable migration path. We are not going to kill everything and expect you to write from scratch. We're going to have a reasonable code path.
can, can you speak louder? So, uh, IE8, yeah. So one thing to point here is I didn't want to say you're going to give a timeline for IE8 support. I'm just saying it's right not now it's on the radar, right? I mean, we can start thinking about the drop 6, 7, and 8 is on the radar. The next thing is going to be that. I don't know the exact time. I think the steering committee is going to handle that part. But on the other hand, for these features, it doesn't make sense to go to browsers that are not evergreen, which means they, that doesn't auto-update itself. So currently, that means IE 10 plus. So if you're going to use this kind of features with our current intention, and that's what actually Polymer is doing right now. It only provides polyfills for IE 10 plus. So I think we will just follow that. Are all done? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, basically, said not decided yet. <laughs> so, so to summarize, I, there's going to be panel discussion. I think steering committee is already discussing on uh, how to handle the support of older browsers. Uh, I, I was just talking from the perspective of this new upcoming stuff. I can uh, this at the end steering committee's decision, but I think that's not feasible to think about this stuff as. Uh, being IE8 compatible. So, but the old widgets is going to be still there. Go ahead. Yes, there are like currently for the evergreen browsers, IE10 has the only one who, which has some quirks about these features like the mutation observers and so on. There are a few problems with IE10, but most of the features are already there. So, uh, and it's auto-updating, so it should be uh, sufficiently capable in, so in very soon. That's the reason, that's the power of the evergreen process. Yeah. Yes. So the is so to, to repeat the question, uh, if we follow the uh, example series, if we were directly adding event listeners to the DOM events, how are we gonna deal with the memory leaks, right? Uh, hopefully, IE 10 plus is much better in memory leaks, and uh, also we can do smart things about 
uh, about it because we know when the DOM elements are entered into the view and left from the view, so we can behind the scenes make smart decisions about uh, collecting this, but that's something we need to investigate. Good question. Yes, the, so to repeat the question, the first question is uh, what we can do to export these web components as uh, importable web components, right? Is that correct? The second question is uh, this shadow DOM. We didn't see any shadow DOM in my example. So for, yeah, to answer the first question, uh, to answer the first question, it's, I think it's a, that's, uh, to be honest, I didn't investigate the part much about how we're going to make our web components written inside GUID to be used by the JavaScript site in, in an importable way. Uh, the, also, the, the importing part is one of the moving parts of the specs. And although I'm talking about the specs, the specs are still moving forward, and they are dropping stuff, adding stuff, and so on. So uh, being said that it's, uh, it might be just a matter of writing a special linker for this kind of uh, usage. Uh, the second question, uh, the, in, in my examples, I, if you look at the example that was written by hand that was extending an HTML element. So I didn't make a call to create shadow root that didn't create up the shadow root. Shadow root. So it means that uh, for the simplicity, I didn't just add more APIs and make it longer. Uh, I didn't even try. Uh, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. I guess specifically also what, what I was wondering about, though, is if you call create shadow root, is the you know, dollar doc reference in just the code going to continue? If you call, I don't understand. So if I've got chance and I know that it's referencing the document inside a particular widget, and I create a shadow root inside one of these two views, how am I going to guarantee Oh, oh, I see, I see. You are asking, I was accessing the doc from the element itself if I was using shadow root. So the first, there I was just using the, I, even I created the shadow root, it would be later than accessing the document, right? I actually don't know the, the problems with uh, the, uh, the documents. In this case, I was referring with dollar doc, which means it's going to be, uh, very likely they're going to be the one provided by grid, but if you want to use the one in the shadow root, I'm not sure how it's going to work. These are like last week kind of stuff, so. <laughs> oh, I also wanted to mention another thing is that by default, I think uh, showing, displaying the shadow roots oh. inside of the browser uh, in DevTools is disabled, and you actually have to go to the little gear box settings icon and even turn it on. It might even be behind, be behind the Chrome flag. I think by default, actually, you don't see it. Yeah, it in the developer tools, there's a, a flag that enables you to show shadow root, and like source maps, it's in the same UI, you can also choose to show the shadow root. I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>